I, I want to just have a, a, a conversation about language and take a slightly different approach to the same thing. So you're going to keep coming back to those statements. Those are the official statements from the QAA, but that isn't generally how most people engage with um, the issue of constructive alignment. Who's familiar with constructive alignment already? Did anyone come across it in any way, shape, or form? This? Okay. Um, actually, it's very much, um, it's not that it's universally accepted, but it is very much the currency in, in higher education. Um, it was work done um, way back in the late 90s. There's something called the solo taxonomy, which we'll come and talk about in just a moment. But essentially, constructive alignment is a fairly simple idea, which is that you describe the learning that the student's going to do in terms of the outcomes. So you, as the QAA said in their documentation, you say you will, at the end of this course of study, be able to do X, Y, and Z. Constructive alignment is that when you come to assess that, you assess the outcomes. You assess the ability of the student at the end of the program to do X. You don't assess the content. The content, in some senses, in terms of the course design, is fairly irrelevant. You actually have outcomes that you specified. You have assessment, um, which actually is testing the ability of the student to evidence at various levels that um, those outcomes. And as a consequence, all of your teaching and learning activities, in theory, allow the student to articulate those learning outcomes and therefore provide the evidence at the end. So a simple crude example would be if you actually had an intended learning outcome that asked the student to be able to evaluate multilingual, multilingual sources, they might be doing programming policy studies with French and Italian, you would say multilingual sources, you have to be able to evaluate the credibility or validity of those sources. You'd be assessing their ability to do that at the end somehow. Right? And you would also expect them during the course of their study to be doing some of that, to be doing some evaluating, to be looking at those for those sources, to be understanding what's meant by validity, understanding what's meant by reliability, going through processes. So in a sense, the reason we focus on verbs, those words, is that the intention is that the verbs that you use to specify your intended learning outcomes should be assessed, you should be assessing the ability of the student to do that, and all of the teaching and learning activities will also feed into that process, provides them with opportunities. Essentially, this is what I want them to be able to do. That's what I'm going to assess them on. So I'm assessing them as being able to do that. And so when I'm teaching them, I'm going to give them lots of opportunity to practice doing that. So an interesting example that I keep citing to people, and I have to confess, it's very nerve-wracking being filmed, because I have to confess, I don't know where this comes from. But I don't think it is apocryphal. Um, it was one of those things you pick up at a conference and then forget who told you. Is the, is the notion of a, 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 something like a, a program in um, late 20th century French sociology, which has specified outcomes that talks about being able to understand the different national relationships or different trends and, and so on. Um, and that one program was actually being taught in the middle of the day um, on campus by a particular tutor who specialised in Boyars, his kind of uh, illustration of those key learning points. Someone else taught the programme as an evening class, but they were a Jean-Paul Sartre fanatic, so they actually used Sartre to illustrate a lot of their points. And someone else was teaching on the weekend programme, and they used Bourdieu, because that happened to be the you know, late 20th century French sociologist that they liked. And so they taught the same course, but actually used quite different content to illustrate a lot of what was being asked of the students. It didn't stop the students being assessed against the learning outcomes. Because the learning outcomes didn't say, you have to know everything there is about Bourdieu. The learning outcomes would say, you need to understand trends in French cultural society and the influence of the media. So that would be the learning outcome. So the content isn't what you assess. It's quite hard when you work with a lot of academics because they're specialists in content. Content is what they've become very knowledgeable in or about. It's quite difficult to get them to just put the content to one side for a moment while they design the learning. You know, and, and we all do it. I mean, I sit down and you know, my areas are mostly around digital literacy and education and so on. So when I've been given the responsibility of designing a course, and I've designed several and taught several, it is quite tempting to sit down and say, great, you know, well, I'm going to teach them about. And then you go back to your program specification template and have to start writing learning outcomes and assessment and so on. And there is something quite frustrating about that if you're, if you're passionate about your subject and you're passionate about your content. But in theory, 
you could design a program and something else could come along and teach very, very different content to meet those same outcomes. And the argument would be, when you look at outcomes, if the outcomes are too content specific, they're not very good outcomes because they restrict you too much into what you can actually teach. So at the module level, you would tend to avoid over-specifying subject content. There's another section where you write indicative content for a program, but the outcomes, you try and keep them at a fairly non-subject specific level. Can I just ask, at what level then, because presumably at some level a decision is made about content and it isn't just down to the individual tutor, no. so at what level is that sort of decision made? The, the valid, when, when you write the validation document, the module specification, you would put in indicative content. Right. But the, the reason they call it indicative content is that there is actually an opportunity to change it. You can right. change it. And in certain subjects, at certain times, it is perfectly acceptable for, a, for an individual tutor to actually do something different. Mm. Um, but it will vary depending on the nature of the program, you know, and whether in fact the content is, in some, in some programs you're teaching, as we do of course, you're teaching law or you're teaching some aspects of finance, then actually the content in a sense is important yeah. and to a certain degree and obviously you specify that in the learning outcomes. But the argument would be if the content itself is important, it should be specified. So you might have a learning outcome that would say it's important for people to understand European commercial law. Well, European commercial law is clearly content, but it's perfectly acceptable to write that into an outcome because that is what you want them to be assessed on at the end. It's their, you know, their ability to use that and to analyze it and synthesize it and relate it to experience or practical examples and so on. So this is a very, it's, it's a fairly simple idea that says that if I use a verb within uh, an intended learning outcome, I might expect to see that verb used in the teaching activities. Okay. Now, this is where we get into some interesting issues then about whether in fact you should be duplicating the verb that's used in the intended learning outcome in your topic outcomes, which is the conversation I've had with Amanda. Do, do you actually take, a, take the module level learning outcome and in a sense replicate it as a topic level repeatedly? And if so, why and how? So that's something that I think is contested, but we're going to talk about that a little bit um, as well. The second notion, again, this comes from Biggs's work, is that these things uh, have some sense of progression to them. Okay, so you'll start to recognise some of the notion of language and, uh, and levels again. So there's this notion that at a certain level, so we have competence at the top, incompetence at the bottom, and the notion that we go from an understanding of a single aspect through to the ability to extend that knowledge to a, a new domain. So the language that Biggs uses, as we say, this is before anyone has anything structured in terms of their knowledge. Unistructural, they have a single aspect of that particular area. Then they're able to start making, uh, bringing together multiple things within that domain, then drawing relationships between them and then taking them out and extending them to another. So my question to you is, you'll recognize some of the words. These are illustrative verbs that indicate that progression. Where do you think level four, five, six, and seven come on those columns? Have a chat between you and decide if you can agree whether there's a fit, and if there is what the fit is. The point is, um, the reason I've shown you this is um, when, I, when you work with the official documentation and when you work with the list of verbs, whoever it was produced by, there is ambiguity. And the ambiguity is not something to resist, it's actually where the creativity happens. Creativity happens on the edge. So there isn't a nice, neat fit. It, it isn't that he didn't write it with the QAA levels in mind, so the columns don't fit. The notion of progression does, right? The notion that you go from level three, four, five, six, seven, yes, there's a clear sense that if you ignore the verbs and just think in terms of the ability to do this process and to build, to take the, the ability to start relating things, then it starts to feel a little bit more like we've got level three to four to five to six. You know, it sort of starts to feel that way, but even then you would have some variation. And that's largely based on the ability to build on what you already have, as you, as you just said. So, the, and the interesting thing when you look at the verbs is the verbs, in a sense, um, are illustrative, but again, highly contested. You know, it's, 
Um, and as my wife pointed out, it's spelled wrong. Um, <laughs> she's got to think about American spelling and sex. Or Z's, as I like to say, just for more occasion. So these two things are quite important, and I want you to just kind of hold this idea in your head, uh, and then I'm going to make things even more ambiguous in just a second, which is to say, yes, we want to find this alignment, and therefore the verbs become important, but the verbs don't, on, in their own right, specify level. They can't, because it depends on context. doesn't depend specifically on content, but it does depend on the learning context in which the learning is taking place. So that's, that's very important. When we come to then specify objectives, one of my concerns about taking learning outcomes at a modular level and starting to try and replicate them is that we aren't necessarily within a module recognizing that same progression. I'm sure you're encountering that in your practice, but what they're expected to do as an objective in week two isn't necessarily what you might expect them as an objective in week 12 because although the, the verbs could actually be in a fairly low order in week two or three, while they orientate themselves to the domain and they learn about the basic subject areas so that they can, as you say, do, you know, understand what law is and where to find it before they then start trying to apply it. So within a single module, we might expect to see that same level of progression. 